Welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States. We have a very special guest. Tonight's guest, her name is Gloria Haas. She's an award-winning, best-selling author. She's published over 35 books. Uh, all of them are available on Amazon. She's a visionary star seed, a natural born clairvoyant and healer. She has mediumistic abilities, uh, along with having many spiritual gifts. She has experienced multidimensional contact which includes intimate interactions with the greys. Um, and she has also had contact with other alien species. Uh, she's written about her life as a star seed and gray hybrid in her book, My Journey as a Gray Hybrid. Welcome to tonight's show, Gloria Hass. How are you doing this evening? Thank you for having me. I'm doing okay. Uh, it's good to hear. It's uh, Friday night. Uh, your day was a... Uh, one without too much excitement, I hear. Yes, it was one of those days where you wake up tired and you stay tired through the day, no matter what you do, you just don't seem to wake up. What was the first recollection you have of anything unusual in your life ever, of any kind? Having, thinking I was having dreams of being on a spaceship and in a group of extraterrestrials short at gray extraterrestrials with big black eyes and working at a command center and i thought those were dreams when in actuality i found out later that they weren't but my earliest recollection i remember being with a group of other extraterrestrials a bunch of us and I think we were children and we were going off to be, to, you know, to almost like school. So, um, when, how old were you when, when you had the dreams? I started having those dreams when I was um, a child, but then it blocked out until I was in my 20s. So when you were a child, what age are we talking? We're probably talking maybe four or five years of age. Oh, that is young. That's about the earliest I remember my own life is starting around four or five. Some people uh, claim they can, their memory can go all the way back to birth, which is pretty amazing. Um, so did you have a hypnotic regression to pick up um the truth of what was behind your dreams is that no how? i did not have any um i didn't do anything with past life regressions until maybe a couple of years ago but i had all of these dreams before and i could all i also levitated when i slept uh when you slept as a child or as yes an and as an adult <laughs> Okay, so you had dreams and you levitated both as a child. Yes. And were the dreams on the same night as the levitation, or how did that work? I, all I, rem I remember, um, I don't know if they were dreams or if I was, you know, being transported to the ship, because I remember looking over and seeing my bed was empty. And then I was... I think I was on a ship or I was somewhere, but then I also remember coming back over my bed and being told to lay on my back and being lightly dropped back onto my bed and bouncing my head in my pillows lightly. And it was fun. I wanted to keep doing it. <laughs> so I felt myself come back into my body. Um, I, I'm not, I've gotten halfway out of my body, but then in other times I've, I knew I was coming back in my body because when I dropped in, I, it felt like I was bouncing on the bed. And uh, so did you ever um, tie your bed related activities only to aliens or did you ever have out of body experiences or NDEs or anything of that nature? I didn't have any NDEs and astral projections until I was in my 20s. Oh, so you did have them, but just later. Right, a lot later, yes. I remember, because I would look over at my bed, and I wasn't even laying in my bed. There was no body there. And I remember one particular night, I think I was six, five or six, 
and we, my parents, uh, my half brother and I went to my dad's best friends. I think they were in, they were stationed, I believe, in Yuma, Arizona, and we lived in California. And my brother would stay in with their son, and they had two daughters, so there was nowhere for me to sleep, except. And I would, my mom was afraid I would roll out of bed because I would sleepwalk when I was younger. So my, they put me in the middle of my parents in the bed. And I remember this happened on two particular nights. I went, I just laid there and I couldn't sleep. And I'm like, I'd like to get up and I'd like to go somewhere. And next thing I know, I was up. I don't remember where, but I remember falling back on top of the bed and bouncing. And my mom turned over and looked at my dad and said, Bill, I know you're probably restless. Will you just lay still? And he was sound asleep. <laughs> so do you do you think you were dropped back in the bed by the aliens or do you think you were coming back in your body from out of body? I wasn't out of body. There was I was not physically on the bed. I could look over and there was nothing on the bed. With out of body, you look down and you see your body. Okay, well I understand that. So, yeah. okay, so if you looked over and saw your body was not there, mm -hmm. that means if you believe that was an alien experience, that you were returned outside of being in the bed, and you looked over and you just gotten returned. Is that? Mm -hmm. Was that what you're saying? Right. Yes. Okay. And what age was this? About six years of age, five or six. Okay. So did anything happen between the three and four that you mentioned before and the five and six that was notable? No, other than my mother abandoning us for a year. And I was with my dad and his mother. But there was... So when she abandoned you, mm -hmm. did she run off with another man or she, did she just decide she didn't want to be a family woman or what happened exactly she decided she didn't want to be a family woman and she left my bro half brother and i with my dad and she took off for california and, and where were you living at the time she took off indiana you, in, in indiana mm -hmm. okay and how where does yuma come in uh, that was where my dad's best friend was we relocated to california when my mother came back a year later She's that we had to move to California to be near her family and get oh, okay. away from my dad's so you, family. You, well, give me a timeline of your uh, where you were at the age of three or four, then where you were at the uh, a little late, how, how your physical moves moved around. Where were you okay. and where? How to, uh, uh, I came into being in Indiana. Indiana, okay. And, and then my mom was gone till I was four and a half, about four years of age. Okay. And then we moved right away to California. So by the time I, we, I was five years old, we were living in Southern California. So you remember between the age of three and four? Mm -hmm. That's that's amazing. That's, that's pretty young for, I, I feel like that's kind of young for a human to remember their time. I was, I was being sexually abused by my dad and his mom. Oh, no wonder you remember it because yes. you remember it because there was something extremely memorable about that age. Right. I remember when my mom left and I remember when she came back. You were abused by your dad or who was you? And his mother. And your dad and his mother. Mm -hmm. um, and whatever happened to your dad, is he still up? No, he passed away when he was um, 62. Did you ever forgive him? Oh, yes. Did you? Yes. That's amazing. I mean, that has to be amazing that you were able to do that. I mean, that's almost as a mir if not more of a miracle than in your alien stuff. I mean, being able to forgive somebody for doing that heinous of an act to you has to be very... Um, I mean, that's a very amazing thing to do, I think. It took over 20 years for me to forgive him when... But you did it. Yes, I did. And how did, uh, at, the, at the risk of jumping around, mm -hmm. how did you, uh, how did you uh, come to forgive him? What did you go through that brought you to that, that point where you could do that? 
years of therapy. Oh. I have been through 43 years of therapy. Talk therapy. Yes. And you, um, EMDR. Okay, I know what that is. Did you ever get, did any of your therapy ever include uh, hypnotic regressions or anything of that nature? We tried it with um, the EMDR, but I was not able to be put under. Okay. Well, I've, I've, as a, I'm a hypnotherapist myself, and as a um, hypnotherapist, I've been able to um, put myself under many times, and I've worked with other hypnotherapists that put me under. And even though I've been in a trance hundreds of times, I've never succeeded in regressing ever, not even once. And so I can go into trance, even deep trance, but not, uh, for some reason, I can't go backwards or forwards like I do with my clients. And uh, so um, back to your story. Uh, Charles, okay, so, real well, quick, when I put, I can put myself into a hypnotic trance yeah. And I can regress, but when somebody else does it, I have a difficult time because of trust issues. Well, okay. Yeah. So I understand that, and I can explain that to you, uh, and maybe it'll help you. I don't know. Uh, I had a client who um, um, I was on a ghost hunt in mm -hmm. Skykomish, Washington, and there was a lady there who told me about her issue that she that she was never able to sleep ever. She had like really, really super bad insomnia. And and she told me that she was abused and this and that. And I told her I could help her out. And uh, I did a, a single session with her and it really helped her. But um, there was another lady at that same convention that um, she, um, she hung out with me. I, I hung out with one lady and her and a, another guy. We didn't do anything we shouldn't have done. It was just all public, uh, you know, normal above board type stuff. But we hung out in a, like in a public venue, like going out to eat, that sort of thing. And she came to trust me over the weekend that I was at this uh, two, two, today, two or three days I was at this convention and then I had a session with her and it was the fastest session I've ever done in my life. The whole session, usually it takes me like 20 minutes to put somebody under. With, with her, we did the whole session in 20 minutes and that includes induction and everything. And she sent me a check later so I know it worked. She didn't have to send me any money at all but she sent me a check a week or two later and for to pay me and so I know it worked, but the point it, the point I'm making is that uh, she probably would not have uh, done a uh, a session in 20 minutes total if she didn't fully trust me, and she did learn to trust me over being around me for a day or two, a couple of days. So my point here is that. Um, if you have trust issues with hypnotherapists, that you need to find one that you trust more and then spend some time with them enough to where you deepen that trust. And then after you do that, you should be able to achieve whatever you're seeking. And uh, regarding regressions for your um, alien stuff, I'll be happy to help you without charging you anytime you have a desire for that because I've always had a desire to work with people like yourself and I've been around uh, the UFO field my whole life or mo most of it and uh, and I've known people who have many confidences like uh, with people like yourself but they never confided in me to hand to give me one of their clients so I've only had a chance to work with one hip abductee so far. She was a breeder for the Greys, and and uh, her story <coughs> her story's in my book. 
But uh, in any case, let's get back to your story. Between the age of three and the age of four, you went from Indiana to uh, to Southern California. What city did you move to? We lived somewhere in the Southern California area. I don't remember the exact city. I know we moved around a couple of times. And so when did you, when did Arizona, Yuma, Arizona get involved? Um, that's when we were living I, um, in, we may have been living in San Pedro or North Hollywood at the time. I don't remember, but my dad's best friend was stationed in the Marines in Yuma, Arizona. So we would get together every once in a while and sometimes they would come with their kids to where we lived and stay for a weekend or we would, my brother and my parents and I would go to them and stay for a weekend. So how, how far was it from, relatively speaking, do you remember how long it took to get from wherever you were in Southern Arizona to Yuma? No, because I'd go to sleep. Ah, there we go. <laughs> that's, that's normal. Kids get to sleep. Uh, yeah. While well, the parents have to stay awake, at least one of the parents, the driver has to. Uh, so, okay, so you're, uh, I think we're at the age of four or five. Go, go five. from there. About five. Go forward from there to your first uh, or next unusual experience around that age. I was about eight or nine. And I remember, I think it was a Saturday because my dad and brother were gone. And I asked my mom if, you know, I was bored. And I asked her if one of my girlfriends could come over and play. And we lived like a couple of doors down from the park, the, the community park. And she said, why don't you go ask your friend if, she, you know, to go, to the, she can go to the park with you. I went to go pick up the phone. She said, no, you can walk to her house. So that way my mom could have some peace and quiet. She was washing dishes and I didn't get to understand that till I became an adult. So I walked down and um, asked if my girlfriend could, you know, go to the park and her parents said yes. And we weren't that far from our house. How, how, how far was your girlfriend's house from your house? Well, I would probably say. Relatively speaking. About a quarter of a mile if that long. Okay, go ahead. Go with you. Go ahead with your story. And I walked down. That's when kids could walk safely down the street. Sure. And so I went to her house. We were coming back, and we were a couple of, because where my house was, then there were a field in between, and then the neighbor's house. So we were, okay, let's say that we were east of my house, about two houses. And then my girlfriend said, look, there's a horse laying in the, in the street. And I said, yeah, oh, yeah. And so we started walking really slow. So we, because she had horses and we thought it was, you know, the neighbor's horse got out because there was a neighbor across the street who had horses and because it looked like one of their um, thoroughbreds. So it was laying on its side. And as we walked up, we saw that it had been dismembered and there was blood around it. It was only half a body laying on the street. And, and how were you, eight? Yeah, about eight or nine. Oh, that's pretty uh, pretty horrific for an eight-year-old. Yeah, Go ahead. Go so ahead. my girlfriend went and got her mom. I went and got my mom. And it took a while for my mom to, you know, I had to talk her into it. And I said, well, she went to get her mom. So by the time that we got out, there was no horse. And that looked like an outline of a horse in dried blood. And our both of our parents thought that we were pulling a prank and that we had gotten some red paint. And it would have to have been a lot of red paint, you know, to put on the ground. And we both got put on restriction. But anyway, well, hold on, stop for a second. So uh, your parent, one of your parents could have taken their their uh, tongue licked their finger, stuck it in the the uh, blood, mm -hmm. and then sniffed it or licked it, and they would have known it was real blood. But they didn't. Our, our moms didn't believe us. They wouldn't even do it and said that we were playing pranks. So my girlfriend went home with her mom, and my mom said, take a few minutes because I need to cool off. This has been a horrible prank. I said, I didn't do anything. And she was like, just give me some time. So when she got into the house, I looked 
I, you know, I looked down again at the ground and then I heard look up and I looked up and just above a 70 foot tree was the underside of a, a silver UFO. And all I looked up and said, what did this horse ever do to you to deserve this? And then I looked back down at the ground and looked back up and the UFO was gone and I went into the house and I got in trouble. But within a couple of days, within by evening, all of that where the blood was just looked like moist ground by the time my dad and brother got home and the next day it was completely gone. So um, did you ever come to any, any belief about uh, why the horse was mutilated, who mutilated it, which set of aliens mutilated it and why they did it? Did you ever come to any belief or idea of why any of that happened? I think it was there to maybe jog my memory to see if I remembered being an, you know, an extraterrestrial. I don't know because I didn't think anything of looking up at the ship saying, what did this horse do? I was upset that they wasted an animal's, at the time I was thinking wasted an animal's life. And while well, it is still a waste of a life, and I went into the house, but then about a few months after that was when I started having more visitations by little green men with long spiky fingers, and they would come and poke at me, leave scratches, puncture marks on my legs, and everything, and that happened for, a, I don't remember, for it was quite a while. So go to your next experience that happened after the horse. The little green men. Go to one of those experiences and take us through. It, they would come into my room at night after my parents were asleep and the hall light was on because, no, the hall light was off because it was after these experiences my mom started leaving the hall light on because I did not want it dark in the house. I didn't, because that's when they, the little green men would come and they would, poke at me and I would scream, they would move my bed, they would laugh, they would jeer at me and everything. And I would be standing up in my bed and they'd be moving it to where I would fall, almost fell out of bed, but I fell down. And then I would be screaming for my mom. And by the time she came in and turned the light on, they were gone. But my bed was in the middle of the floor. Uh, when you say your bed was in the middle of the floor, you mean it was moved? Yes, from the wall to the middle of the bedroom. Okay, so I assume you've drawn what the aliens look like in your book. No, I just described them. Oh, so you, have, you, haven't, you haven't put a drawing of the aliens in your book anywhere? No. Oh, uh... Is it possible? Do you have a, how good is your memory of them? Very good. They had the big round eyes. They had really ugly looking teeth and um, the long, they had long nails, how, very how, like spikes. How good of an artist are you? I'm not. <laughs> Do you know any artists by any chance? No, I don't. Well, uh, if I find one, I will hook them up with you and uh, like, you know, a sketch artist like for the police mm -hmm. and have the, hopefully you and the artist can get together and we can come up with a um, an image of these aliens so that, you know, I've seen various books where you have tons of drawings of aliens in the books, but uh, maybe we can match it up with a race of some kind. That would be cool. Uh, so can you go, how many times did they, relatively speaking, did they come to you at that time for that purpose? It seemed like forever. I would probably say one to two months. And um, then after, the, I remember the lady in white appeared one night in my doorway. And she said, you don't have to worry. They will never come back you are safe. And she left and they never came back. The little green men never came back. How many times did they come before they were expelled? Relatively I would, speaking. 
one to two months. I don't know. I mean, exactly. you don't have a number. No, they would come almost every night. No. Every night for almost every night for one to two months. Yes. So that's like 60 some 60 50 ish times. OK, and um, and what age were you when that started? About eight and a half, nine years of age. OK, and um, when did you first encounter the lady in white? Around that same time. OK, was there anything that happened between the encounters with the greys that you just mentioned and the lady in white? Was there anything between those two events? They weren't the greys. They were green men. They are not greys. Oh, please do tell. They had big bulging eyes that were almost like a whitish green. And um, yeah, their eyes bulged. So they, they, you're saying they weren't the typical gray that people think about. That's okay. right. No, they weren't. So you say green men. What? There's a lot of different shades of green. So I to, would uh, say about frog green. They were the color of a frog. OK, that sort of helps. Um, how tall were they? They were probably about two to three feet tall. Oh, that is short. That's even short. Most grays are typically the, what I hear from people I've talked to. My uh, interviewees, they're usually four and a half to f feet tallish. Two and a half, two two to two and a half foot tall. That is short. Yes. Oh my God. And they were green. And mm -hmm. how did how, were their heads? How how? How did they look different from your typical gray? Think about what was on Whitley Strieber's uh, communion, the 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 the, late, the female gray that's on the cover of his book. How does the head? How is it different? They had a, a round head. They didn't have an oblong head. Okay. They had a round head. It looked like they had sort of like um, almost similar. You know how people have like boils underneath their skin and how their skin gets bumpy. Yeah, so that's of. what their skin looked like. OK, there's something strange about their skin that green colored skin that round heads. They're two and a half foot. And they tall. had weird ears similar to Yoda, but, but sh a lot shorter. OK. And uh, what vibe? How much if somebody were to regress you to each of those events and take you through every single one of them? Um, and give you all that knowledge, the time, as in you would have real time understanding of every moment by moment for every single one of those events, and you stacked up the total amount of time. How long do you think, uh, if you had to guess, I'd how say much time? The 20 minutes. Total for all those events? No, for per event. Per event. Now I'm thinking about the total amount of time. Total amount of time if you stack if you put them all together contiguously uh if you just had to guess how much time they spent with you over that 50-ish number of events how much time do you think that is let's say 20 minutes times 50 that's uh two times five is ten that's a hundred what is that a thousand minutes mm -hmm. Divided by 60, I don't know, that's, I'm losing the math. But uh, anyway, uh, we'll just bypass that question. <laughs> we'll have to go back and do the math in the future. So uh, did anything happen between those events and the lady in white? No. No, I just kept crying out for help. So oh, when you cried out for help, the lady in white came to your assistance? Mm -hmm. Uh, go to the go to the event with the lady in white and take us through that event. Um, it was at night and my bedroom door was partially closed and the hall light was on. And next thing I know, I I woke up. I don't I think I sensed, a, you know, being there and I looked to see I was looking for the little green man and my bedroom door was completely open 
and the lady in white, she was dressed similar to looking like what we see as the Virgin Mary. And she had was emanating this white, beautiful energy from her. And she said telepathically, Gloria, it's everything is okay. You're safe. They're not coming back. I'm making sure that they won't be back. And they never came back. Describe, describe. Okay, so she appeared in the hallway? Is that what in the hallway, right outside my bedroom door. Okay, where were you standing? In your room? Or I was in laying in bed. I was laying in bed. When you opened up my bedroom door, was open. it goes right. She opened the door. Oh, okay. And it, my bedroom went right out into the hallway. Okay, so describe her. She was probably 5'7", five, 5'8", five, about the same height as my dad. And she looked like the Virgin Mary. And she had all this white, she was dressed in white and glowed all this white energy. And I just felt, I, I don't know, I, I felt safe with her. But at the same time, I was leery, not after, you know, just after having all the little green men for however long, you know, and then she appeared and that was the only time I saw her. She was only there probably maybe 20, 30 seconds told me that everything was fine. That's all that I saw. So was she standing or hovering or? She was standing in the hallway. And was she solid, three-dimensional, two-dimensional? I don't know. She was glowing energy. That's all that I saw. But, but I, I, okay. Like Virgin Mary. So I, I've seen disincarnates, right? And when I say disincarnates, I mean something that's not physical and um, when I did see them, they were two dimensional. They were always two dimensional, which means they had height and width, but no depth. And it was like they were on, like on a, like projected onto a um, screen, but they're not projected onto a screen. So there was, there were two dimensional, not three dimensional. So was she, did she have depth? Yes, she okay. looked like she had depth. So she was three dimensional. Okay. And she looked like as solid as you or me or, or, mm -hmm. okay. All right. But with glowing energy coming from her. And so you got a very positive vibe from her. Mm -hmm. Did she, she, she didn't give you her name or anything. She just said, they're not coming back. Right. That's all she said was, I was safe. I didn't have to worry and they were not coming back. Have you, come up with any ideas about who you think she is? No, I just call her Lady in White. Okay. Um, so you don't, do you think she was an angel or do you think she was um, high, like a higher dimensional alien or you have any speculated about the matter at all, any? I've never given it much thought. I'm okay. just taking it at face value. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, so go past the lady in white to the next event you remember that you want to relate? I don't think I had any more other than um, demons coming out and ghosts coming out of my, in my room. So, so what age were you when you first encountered a demon? It was around the time that Abbott and Costello were doing you know, uh, Alvin Costello meet Frankenstein, Dracula, the werewolf with Lon Chaney Jr. It was around that time. I don't, I think that it was even like, uh, God, it must have been in the 60s. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, or, yeah, or earlier than the 60s. No, so, I saw them in the 1960s. Okay. All right. So. Uh, do you mind relating the first demonic? I'd rather not. Okay, that's fine. I, I don't necessarily want people to recall anything that horrific, but uh, they were long experiences you had with demons? Yes. Okay, and they in, you encountered them in the room of your eight my, and a half. In my bedroom, and that's all I want to talk about it, please. That's fine. All right, so uh, what you said you encountered ghosts also? At the same time, yes. 
Okay, do you want to talk about the ghosts? No, I don't. Okay, that's fine. Uh, you can avoid anything you want to avoid. You're, you're <laughs> safe with me. Uh, so uh, after the, gr the green aliens mm -hmm. and after the lady in white and the demons and the ghosts, after all of that is done, did you have anything else happen in your life beyond that? Not until I was in my 20s. Okay, well, go to, go to those experiences. I was um, 20, just before 20, age 21 when I got married. And I remember I was still levitating when I slept off and on during that whole time. But there was nothing regarding extraterrestrials. And then I remember that we're talking about the 1977 is when I got married. And then we saw Close Encounters of the Third Kind the following year. I believe it was, or the, I think it was 1978 or 1979. But in between my first year of marriage and 77, I had three pregnancies. I was impregnated by the Greys. And do you remember the the events that where you got impregnated? Mm -hmm. They were in at one time they took me aboard the spaceship. Um, I saw the greys. Um, I thought it was the greys because I remember a young gray took me afterwards and said, this is where they took you. They were working with the tall white greys, the tall white yeah, extraterrestrials, and they were dressed like in surgical gowns, white outfits, white gloves, white, um, look like they had white masks and they, they floated around the room. They didn't walk, but I was in this room, looked like a metallic table and I didn't have any clothes on. And I remember going, thinking I'm getting out of here but they had sealed the room to where I couldn't. And I got up and walked and they said, you need to get back on the table. We're not finished yet. And I thought, I'm out of here. I'm done. I want to go home. And they're like, get back on the table or we will force you. So I got back on the table. And next thing I remember, I'm waking up in bed and I missed my, I had already missed my cycle. So I knew that I was pregnant by my human husband and they impregnated me with, uh, I found out in 2022, it was a gray. So I was basically pregnant with, you could, with fraternal, with two different embryos, one human and one extraterrestrial. At the same time? At the same time. And how many uh, gray hybrid uh, babies do you feel, do, do you have any idea how many you've had total? I three that I know of. And I remember as a teenager, I would miss my menstrual cycle, completely miss it for eight weeks, 12 weeks, 10 weeks. And my sides would hurt, but there was nothing. I didn't have any cysts. So I started putting two and two together that they may have harvested my eggs. And I didn't have any menstrual cycle. And I have in the last year seen um, connected with two men and one. I had had a lot of similar health issues that a cousin of mine has and a lot of same interests that I have. And the other and he also inherited the same type of mental illness my mom has. So I asked i said is this a product of me and when he and i heard yes and he said he wasn't supposed to have been born because his parents hadn't been together for a year and his dad was um, away on business for a year and his mom got pregnant and she said i don't even know how i got pregnant with you because she hadn't had any relationship with anyone so getting back so I believe that I may have other hybrid children out there from where they harvested my eggs. But, but you don't you don't have any idea what the total is? No, I don't. And so um, the 
uh, other, do you have any other onboard experience memory after the one you just related? I remember being on board I, as an extraterrestrial. I worked in search, rescue, and recovery of other extraterrestrials. I remember being a in past that. life. Yeah, before I became a human. Yeah. How did you How did you recover that past life? In my dreams, I thought they were they were dreams, and actually, they were memories coming forward. And how how much of that uh, lifetime have, would you say you've recovered in your in your dreams? I I remember it's interesting because yesterday I saw a picture of a place in Cotswold in England. And I went, wait a minute, that looks familiar, like I've been there before. And it was on two or three, two trips that I had taken there. And I believe it was in another dimension of time. We call it time, but we know there's no time. It was another dimension that I had gone in to do re rescue and recovery of an extraterrestrial. And I also remember being in the not on the surface of the planet, but underneath inside the planet where there is um, where they have a base that I would work at. Uh, I don't know if it's Earth. Back or up and, can you back up and planet. repeat that one more time? <laughs> you okay. added there was a base. Where right. Were, underneath uh, the planet's surface. This planet. I don't know. I don't know if it was a planet. Earth. Okay, it was underneath a planet. a planet's surface, mm -hmm. you were in a, and this is in the previous life. Right. Okay, so you, um, you were underneath a planet as an alien, uh, mm -hmm. rescuing other aliens. Or right. Other Actually, when I was under the planet, in under the planet's surface, it was completely different. It was um, taking care of animals and gardening and making sure that everything that had been recovered on Earth was being reproduced so they could save, save the species. But when I was doing rescue and recovery, I was on the spaceship. Okay, so is this two different lifetimes or the different pieces of one lifetime? Different pieces of one lifetime. Okay, so you, as an alien, you were, what? T first of all, let's back up for a second. What type of alien were you? A gray. And Benevolent when gray. you, okay, so there's, there's like, I, I get the impression from everything I've learned that there's like tons of different types of grays. Were you tall, short, color? Give us any kind of, we need more details about what kind of gray you were. Short with, um, a light to medium, gray, light, I would say a lightish um, gray skin, and I did have the large black eyes. And uh, some people say that the, the blackness of the eyes is an eye cover, not the actual eye. Right. Do you believe that's also true? Yes, because I've seen my daughter without the eye cover, and she has blue eyes. Oh, you're hybrid. Yes. Is she a she's a hybrid, yes. Yes, and she grew up on the spaceship. Mm -hmm. And what a, can you take us through the event where you encountered her? I was... How, first of all, before you go through mm -hmm. it, how old were you when you encountered her? And how old was she? How do you think she was? And then go through the book. Then go through. I, it was October of 2022 while I was writing my book. Okay. And um, I heard, do you want to meet your children? And I said, no, because I didn't know how they had turned out. But I had already had an experience with her, my daughter and my youngest son. And it was a very, it, it was a very, it was a nice, comforting meeting. We were meeting and it was going over technology. And my daughter has... Um, medium brown chestnut color hair and it was like shaped in a bob styled in a bob and she had blue eyes but my youngest son wears 
eye covering, black eye, black eyes, and he's more matter of fact and doesn't really show emotion where my daughter does. And I would say she's in her 40s because I was pregnant with her in 1977. All three of my children were 1977. So you remember the years you were pregnant? Yes. So you know exactly how old your kids are? Actually, t my oldest and my daughter were 77, and then my youngest son was four years later in 1981. So how old would that make them? They'd be in their 40s, wouldn't they? Okay, and so... Um, or close to 50. Do they have names? Yes. Uh, my oldest son was um, Pashenka, my daughter is Trevka, and my youngest son is Itkor. Oh, you have three. Okay, so you know all three of the names. Yeah. And you met all three of them? Yes. And do you mind going through those events where you met them? I was just take actually, my youngest, my Trevka and Itkor and I, met on the spaceship individually. I first met Itkor and then I met Trevka, but Pashenka was all telepathic voice, but I didn't get to see his body until January 9th after he had died. He was killed. Oh, so you're saying one of your three children was killed? Right, this year, January 9th. Do you know how he was killed? Um, the nefarious grace killed him. Oh, so your your grades are the good guys, and right. But Pashenka decided, as a teenager, that he was going to go with the nefarious grace, and then he wanted out after we spoke. And he said, "But the only way is out is through death." And he asked me how I felt about that. I said, "This is your life. This is your choice. I love you regardless of what you do." And he ended up being killed, and then they gave his body back to his um, father. And they contacted me. And then I was taken, I was teleported above the ship. And I was so would the, physically would the, touch his body. So would the good grace ever uh, do anything to the bad grace for killing no. their, their people? As far as I know, I, I stay out of all of that. I don't want to know. That's their job, and if they wanted me to know, they would tell me. Um, wow, your story is amazing. Um, I don't think I've ever talked to anybody with quite, quite as inter I mean, I've talked to some very interesting people, but you're, you're, uh, you're th near the top of my list <laughs> of interesting people. I mean, uh, the fact that you've you know that you've met all three of your ch children. You know their names. Mm -hmm. You know what they look like. You know that the eye cover is real, and some of them have it, some of them don't. And the good, there are the good ones and the bad ones. You don't, you're not stuck in a. Uh, they're all good or they're all bad. Uh, a, a lot of people I talk to that have amazing amounts of knowledge about the aliens are still stuck in that they're all bad or they're all good or or they're not, they have no contrast in their stories. And uh, I, you know, I can't imagine the, the, um, uh, the, that the um, duality ends at the planet's edge. I mean, all aliens can't be good and all aliens can't be evil. It's not possible for them to be either of these. Humans are not all bad and humans are not all good, you know. Yeah, and we're one race. I mean, we're but, not, we're talking different ra races now, you know. I, Even within the same race, ours, you've got the whole, all the way from one end to all the way to the other end, you know. Totally malevolent all the way to, to as benevolent as you can be and everything in between. And we're just one race. Right. So, you know, you figure that, um that type of nuance has to stretch out in in every direction. So even within the the best of races and the worst of races, there has to be a lot of contrast about individuals within the worst and the best races. So 
you can't really, it's really hard to, for me to paint them all, even a single one race, all with a single brush stroke of positive or negative. Is that your understanding? Yes. So I asked, there was a question I asked one of the uh, people I interviewed a while back uh, that I want to ask you. Uh, it's, it comes down to, all right, so um, the, there's different ideas about what the, how the aliens are interact with each other. Like, like for instance, some people say that the, that the, um, the, the, um, was it the, the lizards, uh, what are they called? Reptilians. The reptilians. That we're still fighting the Orion War. That's one line of belief. Or, or what people, are, some people are putting out, okay? And then you have, you will have, um, uh, you have people who go on the ships and see all, a whole boatload of different races, and they're all getting along, and nobody is above anybody. They're all equals. And then you have other people who believe or say that there's all these different levels of of hierarchy of you know, who's got more power and who's got this and that, and you have a lot more nuance. It's, there's no level, you know, we're not all equal, and blah, blah, blah. And, but, you know, and then you've got like uh, intelligence people on Earth saying, you know, remote viewing saying, well, there's three types of aliens. You've got the ones who like us, the ones who hate us, and then there's ones who don't really care one way or the other. So that's that's a third set of ideas, and you know you have a hard time kind of piecing it all together. It's there's just so many different levels of beliefs and understanding, and you know you, you don't necessarily believe anybody's lying, but you still want to try to make some sense of it all. So have with all the um, experiences you've had, and all the understanding you have direct knowledge um have you come to any understanding about especially with the fact that you were um one yourself and i've come across the, i've had other people i've interviewed who were also like you they remembered their uh, very details great details about their past lives as aliens and you know that's not Though that's unusual, it's not that unusual. And so with all that uh, data you have in your head, have you come to any understanding that you can impart which gives humans uh, a better understanding of the larger picture of how it all fits together? There are different species who do interact together. They can the benevolence and the people who are fighting for earth let's say we call them the warriors the benevolent warriors they can have 10 or 12 15 or 20 different species on the spaceship like you would see with star trek you know or right. voyager with all the sure. different ones working and interacting together and you have a commander and then you have the different ranks and everybody has their job and their duty, but they get along. I've had benevolent reptilians walking behind me, watching and protecting me. I've had the Anunnaki standing in the middle of the street watching me when my dog was alive, walking my dog. I've seen shadow beings. I've walked through different dimensions. And then next thing I know, there's a spacecraft watching over me in the mornings and in, you know whenever it was dark whenever i walked my dog and other people have realized that so we do have people we do have people who are protected like me like me by the extraterrestrials we also have the benevolent warriors looking out for planet earth so we're not alone. It's not like we're fighting all this battle against the mean guys, the mean reptilians, and who are, are working with the government. And we, have, we do have different factions, but I 
The re I know that my experience has been with the different species. Like I've seen the ant people as they're here and they're they're the, you're the they're the workers. They come and go. They've been here since the 1920s. 1930s and they go to work they come home they go to work they come home but they are out in mainstream of the human race but they are here to help put things in motion and they basically stay to themselves they do their job they're not out saying oh i'm an extraterrestrial by night and i'm a human by day they don't do that. They have, like I said, they have their job and they're looking out for Earth and they want to make sure that people are okay and pick up the vibe of what everybody's going through. And they have a calming presence about them. It's been my experience. The ant people. Mm -hmm. Are they the ones that went underground? I've seen them above ground. I've seen them, but that was, I was taken back to when they were initially here i um i don't know if they were initially here but i remember the 1920s i was tell i was um taken in i was telepathically shown and i was standing on the street and i was looking at people's dress the way they dressed with the men with the with the long they had the um you know how they had suit coats on and then they had the long dress coat over it and the hats and the women with with um skirts and wearing heels and I remember saying, why am I here? Who are these people? And I remember a being coming up next to me and she said, you are here to see this for a reason. And these are the ant people. And I was able to see their ant uh, body underneath all the clothes. And then they cloaked back to looking like a human. And how many races do you think are uh, walking amongst us? How many different races? I've seen 22. On I've, Earth? On Earth, yes. 22. I've seen 22. And how much That's, of your experience is in your book? Do you have a copy of your book with you? Um, yeah, let me go get it. Oh, right. I don't have it in this book. I have it in my next book coming out do in a couple of weeks. Do you have a, a copy weeks. of both of your books with you or any of your books? Do you have any copies of any of your books? On Yeah, I have it on. Let me bring up the Word document. I mean a physical copy. The, cop, the book that I have coming out in a few weeks, no. I haven't uplift. uplift. I mean in, in, any books that you've done at all. Do you have a physical have copy of any book? Yeah, I have my journey as a gray hybrid. Can you show it? Yeah, I'll be right back. All right. making sure I have the right earbud in the right ear <laughs> and the left one in the left ear. They feel weird. Yep. Here's my journey as a gray hybrid. Scoot it uh, over your face a little bit. Uh, yeah, right there. Uh, my journey as a gray hybrid. Okay, so um, how much are, um, and what's the name of your latest book? It's not going to be out until the middle of February. And it's called Extraterrestrial, Metaphysical, Paranormal, and Visionary Encounters, Years 2022 and 2023. And did you self-publish these books or did you have a... Yes, I self-published them on Amazon. And so, um, well, I love you pick your brain on that one. Uh, <laughs> one of these days when you have the time, uh, if you want to barter, you know, I'll be glad to regress you and stuff like that as much as you like. Okay. If you will uh, do me the favor of help me getting my book published, self-published. I will do that. And uh, so uh, my journey is a gray hybrid. That kind of, that title kind of self-explanatory. Yeah, and I made the book cover myself. My journey is a gray hybrid. Okay, yeah, I so. I did the book cover with, this looks like a star, in, you know, in the middle of it. 
What does that represent, the star itself? That is part, it's reminding of the universe. Stars are planets. Okay. And we're all, you know, from, we're from the stars. So you wrote a whole book on your, on your past life? I put parts of it in this book and I put parts of it in the upcoming book. Yeah. Okay. So how much of that book you just showed is your past life and how much of it is your current life? Well, chapter two talks about. Just percentage wise. Just a, just a ballpark. I would probably say maybe a quarter. Quarter of it is your what? It, uh, my past life, a quarter probably is uh, my past life, and um, but it's interspersed throughout, you know, throughout the book. Might be even half the book might be about it because it also you know, about a quarter of it's my um, past life, and then the rest of it has to do with my life as a human. Okay. With UFO experiences. And so, and you given the, give us the name of your new book again. It's called Extraterrestrial, Metaphysical, Paranormal, and Visionary Encounters, years 2022 and 2023. Oh wow, uh, that's a mouthful, I know. <laughs> it is. My my book has got a long, very long title. It, it, the the title itself is very short, but if you read the subtitle with it, it just goes on and on. <laughs> so uh, we've gone past an hour, and I feel like I could do, with all your knowledge, I could just go on forever. But I know you've got you're tired. It's uh, Friday night. You want to do other things, and uh, I'm more than willing to stop the show whenever you're ready. Uh, but I do want one thing from you before we go, and that is I'd like you to promise to come back. <laughs> yes, I promise to come back. <laughs> okay, uh, because your story is fascinating, and I know I've just grasped the surface uh, just by the way you talk, and um, um, I'm. is there anything else you want to say to the audience who, like, you know who Daryl Sims is, right? No, I don't. Oh, he's he's called the Alien Hunter. I've interviewed him, and he he thinks all aliens are evil, but uh, but he's also an abductee, and his children are also abductees. So he's not very happy with being an abductee. So um, I don't know if the aliens are taking him are nefarious or that the good guys. I really have no clue because he hasn't really clued me in that much so but the reason, only reason I brought him up is because he's the kind of person who thinks they're all evil and um, I can't quite get my mind around that concept but I'm not an abductee so I have to I have to be okay with him thinking that because that's his based on he's got a ton of knowledge from his own experiences plus other people he's dealt with so I can't totally discount what he's saying because you know it's as valid as anything else so but I bring him up because I want to contrast you're not saying they're all evil you're not saying they're all good you have the contrast you have both is there anything along those lines or anything else that you want to say to the people uh, before we end this that you feel compelled to say at this moment there are some people who have all bad experiences. There are some people who have all good experiences. They have never had, the ones who've had bad ones have not, experiences have not had good ones. And vice versa, the ones who've had good experiences have not had bad. But I've had both and mostly good over, and then there's still some bad and I'll wake up with scratches and puncture marks now because of whatever happens while I'm teleported somewhere. And just let people know that if you do craft calling, people want experience to go, well, I want to experience an extraterrestrial. I want to see a UFO. Just know that when you do this, you need to call the benevolent extraterrestrials 
And also, it has been noted, not just by me, but by some other people, Dave Evans, Dave Emmons had told me this. He said, it seems like when you're visited by one extraterrestrial species, another one comes along to see what they're interested in, and then it has a domino effect. I, one night, uh, I, the, Palladi the Palladians came to my bedroom, and I remembered them holding my spirit, looked like they were holding my spirit in their arms, and they were pouring healing into me. The next night, and this wasn't the first time I had experience with the Bigfoot extraterrestrials. This was the second time. So you never. What do you call, what do you call them besides Bigfoot extraterrestrials? They're extra, yeah, they're Bigfoot extraterrestrials. Is there another, isn't there another name, a better name than that for them? That's all I've heard because you have your Bigfoot on the ground, you have some in spaceships, and some have glowing eyes, some don't. And I believe that they're all, my personal belief is that they're, they're all part of the same group. Some are in spaceships, some are here on Earth. You know they don't like being called Bigfoot, right? I don't know. <laughs> they won't come and get me tonight. I just want peace. <laughs> but um, I don't know that. So. Go ahead. That's what, what yeah, I just see. be careful about what you're going to do when you do craft calling, because there will come a time where if you call, they will be there. Some will watch over you and some you have orbs coming in. You have extraterrestrials coming into your home. You're not going to be able to get rid of them. So decide up front. Do you want to live your life with the, them intermingling telepathically with you? I've had them materialize across the street while I'm out walking, was out walking my dog. I've had my daughter and my son in my living room area. I've had reptilians in my living area. And I've also had the panther-like beings walk through my entire apartment. So, you know, it's gets to, it's can be unnerving, especially if you're not ready for it. And you might think you are. And just that impact could be traumatic for you. So be very careful about what adventures you want to have. For me, it's not traumatic as an adult because I can go back to my extraterrestri extraterrestrial roots and I'm working with them. They're working with me. They're here to protect me. And I know that I have angels around and, you know, other beings in my apartment all the time. And what's nice is I don't have to feed them. They can hang out wherever they want and they don't get in the way. <laughs> so you've encountered, you, you say you've, you, that you believe from your own direct experience, there's 22 different races walking on the earth. There's more. I believe more than, there's more than that. And how I've, many of them have you met? Have you come across your, your personally? I, Oh, I've seen the one that I write in the upcoming book. They look like giants. I only saw them from my bedroom window on the mountaintop. But all the others I have encountered up close, 21 up close and personal. Okay. And, but you believe there's a lot more than that? Some people say there are 86 species and there are 90. And other people say that they're... You're talking about, I'm talking about on the, walking the earth. Right. And in and and uh, the galaxy above the Earth, so many people are seeing so many different ones. I've seen swan-like creatures, and people are thinking that they may be the blue people. I said, "Oh no, they're white, like swans." And who knows? There is infinite. I we have so many different galaxies that are in our solar system and outside our solar system. So I don't really think we can put a number on it. You've encountered demons, you've encountered angels, you've been an alien, or you remember being an alien, you've encountered more alien species than I've anybody I've ever met so far that I know of. Uh, with all this direct knowledge of all these different types of beings, there are people who say, who try to pretend that all aliens are evil or that more specifically that they're all demons. Uh, what do you say in response to that belief? I used to be one who believed that, that because of the, of the Bible, 
people were saying in church that um, all aliens are demons. And I'm thinking they can't be because we have angels. And my personal experience, and I've had people tell me that I'm following demons and all aliens are demons. And I'm saying, oh, so you're telling me I was a demon in a previous life. There you go, spouting off that you had a previous life. We only have one life. And I, don't, I, I believe that, and I was talking with someone a while back when I was writing my book and he was like, life is life. We, and then that had, that me, had me put things into perspective we we don't we do have demons a third of the angels and we don't know who fell you know from from heaven with lucifer we don't know how many that is but to me i look at we have all the different species because the bible says god created the heavens and the earth how much out in the heavens which are constantly expanding that science has proven you know, how many more are out there? How many, you know, more beings are out there? I don't believe that aliens are demons. They, I believe they are completely different because I've seen demons and I've seen angels and I've seen aliens. I've seen some demons with w huge wings because I've had visions of them that I would say those are probably demons. They looked as big, as tall as um, the Nephilim. And I've also seen aliens very small, like cockroaches. So I don't see demons and aliens being the same. Uh, thank you for that answer. And I will uh, add that to the end of the show. And uh, thank you again for everything coming on and all the stuff. And let me... Anything else you'd like to say before I really stop the show? <laughs> just keep an open mind. Um, just because you haven't had the experience that other people have had, don't negate. Keep an open mind. Don't negate and say, oh, no, it's not possibly. People come from fear because it's the unknown. Embrace the unknown, get information. And I know there's a lot of different information out there because it's on the people's experience. People are saying they want disclosure from the government. We don't need the government to disclose anything to us. We have people who have had real bona fide experiences like I have. They are the people to believe. So I had another thought that came to mind. You might have a, a, a response or not. Uh, have you heard about the aliens at the Miami Mall? Yes, 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 I have. I. You have an opinion on it? I don't want to drag this out, but do you have an opinion? I really haven't investigated it that much. Some people said they were 10 feet tall. Some said there was the police were out there. There was a fight between teenagers. Is it? A yeah, there were hundreds of police uh, cars out there. And. If there are that many police out there, I would say something happened at the mall other that was extraterrestrial, that was not all human-based. Well, um, I haven't I've really got, investigated it enough. I've, I've got two minds. One of my minds says it was aliens, and another mind says, well, okay. So the, what? one of the part of the story is that the... Um, there was a guy sitting uh, a piece of technology in the middle of the mall. And then after he played with it a little bit, all of a sudden a portal appeared, a circular portable portal, and the aliens started coming out of the portal. Okay. So to me, what that sounds like is one of two things. Either he opened a portal and an alien stepped out, which is possible, or he started up a, uh, have you seen the the um, have you seen the holograms in China on no, YouTube? I, They're I very see. very realistic. They are. And so you can with a hologram with light, you can create any kind of image you want. 
So the guy who was playing with this technology, he either opened a portal and aliens came out, or he started up a holographic generator that generated aliens for people to look at. And uh, they also saw him in one other place, which was outside the mall, at this one location where you had about 100 cop cars videotaped sitting there, flashing their lights all at the same time. That could have also been just as easily holographically generated as well by, uh, you know, something in that spot. And so I'm not saying it's one or the other. I'm just saying, you know, it, it could be either way, right? Anyway. All right. Well, I don't want to keep you here any longer. Uh, I'll let you go. Have uh, Thank you again for being on the show. Please come back. And I look forward to having you on again. I look forward to coming back. Good night. Good night.